You know, each year we host college students coming from across the United States to share in their alternative break program. One of the things I really enjoy is spending some time with these young people, and we usually make it a tradition to climb Stone Mountain. Some of the groups will go early in the morning. Others who are not such uh, early rising college kids will go more in the afternoons or evening. Regardless, we're enjoying this wonderful climb up, and it's a great time of team building, great time of sharing with all these college kids the joys and the beauty of Georgia. Well, along the way, there's a wonderful vista place where you can stop and pause and look out over the horizon. And I'll invite them to say, look, look, do you see City of Light? Uh, what? City of Light, yeah, do you see it? Look out there. What? No, look over there, look a little higher. What? No, over there? Really? Yes, can you see it? Can you see City of Light? Look, there's people waving at you. Can't you see their wave? Please wave back. And the kids all start waving back. And they think, what, they can see us all the way from here? Well, I said, no, I'm just teasing. But what's really important is that you know where you're looking and you know what you're looking at. And you know where to find things by the guidance that's giving to you in life that says, look a little higher, look over here, look over there, how important that is. Because what we find in today's scripture lesson, we find from the ancient truths, is that beautiful invitation to lift up our eyes to the hills. From whence cometh our help? Wow, wait a minute. What's so important about looking at hills and mountains? Now, they're very beautiful. And some of you may have seen the wonderful Rockies or some gorgeous mountain peaks or just even enjoying the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains here in Georgia. They're gorgeous, but that's not what the spiritual truth is that we look to hills or land formations or that we look to stone mountain for some sort of inspiration but what it's there for is a wonderful lesson in metaphorical understanding it been looking beyond the literal to understanding the truth that's there that we raise our eyes up to a higher level that our gaze that our spiritual outlook be up on a higher plane because that's where your help your help is found that's how it's important that we discover this wonderful thing, that it's not a physical destination that we look to, but that we look higher in life, higher in awareness, higher in consciousness, higher in thinking. What is that higher level? But it rises from this earthly plane where we're so bogged down with a sense of negativity, practicality. Let's just be practical. Sense of saying, look at what is seeing that's in the tangible, to gazing higher and understanding and seeing what is possible, infinite possibilities in a spiritual realm. Looking to see, I rise above this world where it's all literally in front of me to see that in God all things are possible. To understand what that may mean as I look and keep my eyes on that kind of gaze, a gaze in a higher plane, a higher consciousness. It's helping us move then from the hopelessness of this journey and this life with all of its challenges to moving to a realm of possibilities, from moving to possibilities then into realities to say, that which I see now is really the reality for me. Though I may have seen a world of lack and confusion, separation, challenges, division, in God, I see a sense and understanding, a oneness that we're all created in this divine image and likeness. And through that, I see the possibilities of loving one another. And this now shapes and forms a new reality for me and how I live my life. You see how wonderful it is that we move from possibilities to realities. And that's what we live out every day here at City of Life. We host a compassion ministries that's inviting people to move through this realm from hopelessness to possibilities to new realities. I love the stories of so many of these men and women who've lived on the streets of Atlanta for so long. They come for a hot meal here or clothing, but really what they come for is a sense of hope, a sense of in my realm of the world that I live in, which it seems like there's so much lack, there's a place of love that's providing something for me. And in that, the stories of the seeds of hope that we planted within those lives of people have taken root and shaped and formed for them as the stories of one by one, they're saying, you know what? I found success in my life again. I found the possibilities that were there, and it's now shaping a new reality for me. I love the story of Joe, who has been sort of the father of the homeless community for quite some time. When we were at our former building location, uh, just about three miles away, 
you know, there were many of the homeless who lived under the streets of the bridges there. Joe was like the granddad or the father of that spiritual, of that homeless community, I should say. And he would rally the troops together. It was him that began to sense his sense of hope building within him and that there were possibilities that he said, you know what, I'm going to break away from this chain of alcoholism. I'm going to break away from the sense of hopelessness. I'm going to actually get a job. I'm going to rebuild my life. And became then someone who worked with the homeless community and other challenges in other ways. I love these stories because this is the story of your life, my life, as we engage in understanding that we may have a world of hopelessness, but we rise, we lift our gaze higher into the spiritual realm, to the realm of possibilities, and then it shapes a new reality for us. We see the world totally different, and it begins to unfold for us in this way. You see, life is all about knowing where to look, really. Are you looking at this, or are you looking at this? Are you looking in the heavenly realm, or are you looking in the earthly realm? Are you looking in the realms of negativity or the realms of positivity? Where is it that your gaze is found? Because it's so important that we understand this. Because it says, I lift up my eyes, I raise my gaze, I look heavenly, I look to this realm. Not that there's a place up in the skies that we're gazing to, but that we understand that heaven within is an awareness that our spiritual eye within is raising up to an understanding of the beauty of the presence of the divine already within us. I go there. That's where I am and where I dwell. And it says it is there that this becomes this plane, should we say, of a higher realm of thinking, a higher realm of knowing, a higher realm of understanding. And the text goes on to say, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Okay. Well, don't we struggle sometimes with that word Lord? We look at it and think, is that a ruler? something over our lives? Is that a male image? And Lord, we think of lords and ladies. We sometimes get caught up so literally and we don't understand the depth of the writer's beauty of this ancient text. For that word Lord really is the word Jehovah, which is the word that says I am. How many remember the story of Moses? Moses out in the desert in a beautiful illustration, of the story of our lives. As Moses cries out to say, I'm going forth. I'm called to release the children of Israel, to go speak to the Pharaoh. Who do I say sent me? Who do I say? I mean, what authority am I moving in? And this burning bush speaks out and says, it is the I am that I am. Oh, this is the Jehovah. The name of Jehovah is the I am that I am. And the Jehovah is the Lord of our life. The Lord Jehovah is the I am that I am. The maker of your heaven, the maker of your earth, the maker of your higher consciousness, the maker of your lower consciousness, is that I am within you. How you view, how you see, how you look at your life. Do you say, I am successful, or do you say, I'll never be successful? Do you say, I am blessed, or I'll never be blessed? Do you say, I am healthy and whole and perfect, or do you say, I'll never be healthy? You see, it's all in how we uh, gaze, what we look at, how we see, that we see that that is the maker of our heaven and our earth, our heaven within us. Oh, it's not something we're creating. It's already there. But we're acknowledging that says, I am this divine presence. I am this revelation of God. I am this child of God. And as I do so, I realize I see the heaven, the realm of God, the kingdom of God within me. I see it. I sense it. I feel it. Wow, it's unfolding for me. You begin to experience, or our gaze is downward. Our gaze is on this earthly plane. I don't see God anywhere. I'm certainly not anything. Church has told me I'm unworthy. They've told me I'm nothing but a mistake, trash. They told me I'm guilty, I'm sinful, I'm all these bad things. How then could I look anywhere other than what has been already taught to me or spoken to me or provided for me? Where does my gaze go? But it's in a downward gaze, you might say. So what we find is that as we look there, we find that this is where our strength comes from. This is where we find our, our hope. We've got to keep our eyes then on the prize. This is so important. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on that which is there for you. That is not to allow ourselves to get distracted in any way whatsoever, but to keep that heavenly gaze that gaze that says, I see, I know, I focus, 
in a higher consciousness every day of my life. I look for the positive. I experience the positive. By I speaking the positive, by affirming the positive, for I know that God is positive, and that which is of the divine is positive. And so I allow this to unfold within me, and I work at this, that I keep my eye on the prize. Keep that eye on the prize, and when you do, you'll find that there is a strength that comes for you. I love telling the story of uh, my, the birth of my son. My uh, wife and I had gone to a a Lamaze class, and there uh, we were taught a wonderful breathing process. I don't think the breathing process was more for me than it was for my wife, uh, because I was like, <laughs> okay, breathe, 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 you know, uh, you know, a child's coming to this world, it's your son, and oh my God, what does this all mean for me? And I'm like, let me just breathe, you know? And of course, in the Lamaze class, we were invited to bring a wonderful focal point. So we selected a beautiful teddy bear that we were going to present to our son and it would be in his crib. It would be a reminder of this wonderful birthing moment. That was our focal point. And so suddenly we're in the midst of the birthing process. Uh, my wife is screaming every vowel there is in the word, A, E, I, O, U. And it was like, whoa, okay, you know. And I'm like, breathe, breathe, breathe. Okay, I gotta breathe. And then keep, on, keep your eye on the focal point, focal point, focal point. I remember that was for me. I forgot to tell her that was for her. But anyway, my point was that this, as I kept my eye on the prize, kept my eye on the focal point, kept my eye on the teddy bear, I realized something wonderful is unfolding. And no matter what's going on in this room, no matter the pain, the agony, the challenge, no matter what we're experiencing in this moment, I'm there for the divine experience. Something that's unfolding is beautiful and wonderful and happening for the miracle of birth and of life coming into this world. You see, once you keep your eye on the prize, your focus is there. And all the other distractions of all the chaos of our world and our community fade away. How important is it we learn to do this? We find the biblical example of Peter invited to get out of the boat and walk on water. Wow. Wait a minute. Walk on water above these chaotic waves of this world? We see it as a beautiful metaphor of our own lives. All the chaotic waters, the thoughts of this world, the ideas, the chaos, the craziness that's going out, that we may be overwhelmed by it. But we're invited by Christ to step out, to walk above all of that chaotic. To walk above it, and we do so as we keep our eyes on Christ. The consciousness of who we are, the awareness of who we are, when we keep our gaze in that place. And isn't it interesting? As Peter removed his gaze, as he changed his thought, what happened? He began to sink, didn't he? He began to feel like he was drowning. So, too, in our own lives, we see this is not Peter's story, it's our story. It's you and my, my story. It's our story that when we lose gaze, our gaze on the upward consciousness, on the higher things, the positive, the wonderful goodness of God, the blessings that are there unfolding for us, when we are in the midst of birthing something and we need a teddy bear to look at, let me tell you, it's the divine essence that we begin to raise our thoughts to. It helps us and carries us through that we may walk above this world of chaotic thought and craziness in the world that's all around us that would be filled with fear and guilt and shame, filled with all these elements that may want to tear us down and destroy us. So the key is that we, our vision never be distracted. Oh, how easy that is said. That our vision never be distracted, because aren't we all about shiny things? And there we go. You know, all we need is something there that in our world, in our lives, that just kind of distracts us at a moment, and we just follow after it so easily and so quickly. There may be something that presents to us and, and it looks attractive and suddenly we lost that heavenward gaze. We lost that inwards positioning of our spiritual eye saying, I see, I know, I believe all things are working together for good. But in the midst of distraction, we lose sight of that. What do we find that in the stories of the children of Israel, again, Bible stories are our stories. They're always telling us about who we are in our journey of life. Because we're just like those children of Israel who began to be so eager to follow after the things of God. And they were so excited and saying, yes, we're going into the possess the promised land. We're going in and we're going to be victors and we're going to do all these wonderful things. And then what happened? They got distracted. And what happened? An enemy took over. And you find the stories of the children of Israel being led off into captivity. 
And then one day they wake up and go, wait a minute. We've been looking at the wrong things. We've got to get our eyes back on the divine, on the revelation of the good. We've got to get our eyes back onto this. We've been distracted. Look what happened. And suddenly they're liberated and free, only to find that. What do they do again? Shiny things. They get distracted. They run off and go on something else, another tangent. And then they go, what happens? Once again, they're taken over by uh, an enemy uh, uh, element within their life, and they're held off in captivity. And then they are there, and then they finally wake up. Oh, wait a minute. A prophet is telling us, someone is giving us advice, saying that maybe we need to pay more attention. Maybe we need to keep our focus. Maybe not to be distracted. Suddenly they're liberated. They're back at, well, we could go on and on. It's a vicious cycle with those children of Israel. And it's a vicious cycle for us. Because we all can say, I had my eyes on God. And then I got distracted. I had my eyes on the divine. I knew that the possibilities were there. I got distracted, and then I fell into, shall we say, captivity of this negativity, this doubt, this fear, this element of this world, the stress, the worry. It held me captive. It held me in bondage. Then I woke up, and then I changed my mind, and then I got back on it. It's like that old story of the man who walked down the street, and without paying any attention, he fell into a hole. He was in the hole for the longest time and finally found a way to get out of the hole and walk down the street on home. The next day, he walked down the same street. He fell in the same hole. He sat in the hole for a while, and he figured, I got to get out of here somehow. How do I get out? He figured a way to climb out. He walked on home. The next day, he walks down the same street. He falls into the hole. He's in the hole, and he says, wait a minute. I got to get out of this hole. And then he realizes, wait, this is craziness. I got to find a way out of it. He climbs out of the hole. He walks on home. The next day, he walks down the street and says, I ain't doing that again. I'm going to change. I'm not going to walk down that street. I'm going a different pathway. We take, what will it take for us to come to that place where we realize that the call of this ancient truth is to every day keep your focus, your gaze, on that higher consciousness, that higher place where we're not distracted any time, where, where our eyes are uplifting and seeing possibilities within our lives versus what may be there. By moving from the realms of our hopelessness, moving into possibilities, and then changing into realities. So let me tell you this. Don't let the thoughts of your life go elsewhere, but being steadfast on the divine. Because otherwise we will be like the children of Israel and we have to overcome the Philistines, the Philistines in our life. What are those Philistines in our life? Well, those are those things that we allow to distract us, take us down a journey, that take us away from our focus on our highest and best. Let me tell you this, those negative thoughts, those negative thinkers, petty thinkers are those who are always limited to the physical. And what do they do? They look down instead of look up. They look down. Their interest is where they are and not where they're going. That's so true in our life. Is your interest where you are or where you're going? Because you know where you're going? Let me tell you this. In driver's ed, what's the very first thing that you learn in driver's ed? Keep your eyes on where you're going, right? You get in the car. You're a young teenager. And you think the first thing is adjust the radio. Right? Of course, yes. Uh huh. Get the tunes going, you know. First thing you do is roll the window down, adjust the seat, looking cool. So you're driving, you know, you got everything looking. That's not the first thing. The first thing is do you know where you're going? And keep your eyes on where you're going. Because you can get so distracted by all kinds of things in the life, and you don't have your vision forward. And before you know it, you wreck the dad's car and you're in trouble, right? Because what did you do? You got distracted. You didn't know where you, you were kept looking at where you are versus where you're going in your spiritual life. Are you thinking about where you are? Or are you thinking about where you're going? Where am I going in this relationship with God? Where am I going in my spiritual walk? How is it unfolding for me? What's, it, what's changing for me? I don't want to know about, I, I see where I am, but in the midst of where I am, well, I look around me and, Maybe I've got challenges, I've got difficulties, I've got things that bog me down, or my life isn't moving as smoothly and as perfectly as I'd like it to be. And Oh, but where am I going? Ah, I'm going into the realm of wonderful possibilities and new realities. That's where I'm headed. And so it is that we then mentally 
we begin to change everything. And we begin to deny our fears as one of the keys. We deny our fears until they're out of existence. We begin to say, this has no power over me. This has no power over me. Because let me tell you this. The things that you fear are things that you give power to. They're powerless unless you give power to them, right? They have no power of their own, but they have the power that they have over you is exactly the power that you've given to them, that you've placed into them, that you've handed over. That's the, the challenge that we live in our lives, and we realize that we can drive this out of our subconscious by we saying that this has no power over my life. And I know that because I stopped giving it power. I love this. In Sunday school years ago, in one of my early pastorates, I've been a pastor for 41 years, and I've had the opportunity of working with a variety of different congregations. There was a young woman who said, well, I'm going to go out and buy all kinds of things for the Sunday school classrooms for the kids. And she purchased these wonderful little owl clocks, little plastic owl clock that was put on the wall, and the owl, the face of the owl, uh, you know, and the eyes went back and forth, and it was just a cute little animal. I, the next lady, a lady came in from the church. She said, oh, get rid of those owls. They're of the devil. Don't you realize that's satanic? Like, really? Everybody's like, what are you talking about? Yes, in my belief, in my system, in my understanding, owls symbolize the devil and symbolize, oh, what? I said to her, if you believe that that clock has demonic power over you, you're right because you believe it. But that little plastic clock that symbolizes a simple owl has no power unless you give it power. Now, the choice is yours. Do you believe that you walk in terror and fear all the time over this? Or do you change your outlook and your thinking and you realize I'm moving to a higher level and this has no, this has no power over me? This plastic clock, no matter what, no matter what symbol it is, it has no power over me because I stopped giving it power. Wow. Pretty amazing as she began to realize maybe plastic owl clocks are okay, you know. Well, let me tell you this, that the universe will not fail you. That law of mind that says, as you think, so you are, is always at work. So as you think about these things in the world, as you think about your fears, they're going to be there. They're going to manifest for you. If you think you can't, if you think you're a failure, let me tell you, if you think no one will love you or accept you, you're right. Because that's what you're thinking. And that's how you act. You know, have you ever seen those people come to a party and uh, they're like, I'm going to go to this party, but no one's going to talk to me. No one's going to say anything to me. So I'm just going to step over here. And you know what? I know that nobody really wants to talk to me. And I'm really not good at talking to people. Before you know it, they're the ones over by the wall called the wallflower. And then they wonder why they went to a party and nobody spoke to them. Well, because nobody knew that you were there. You were hiding under that lampshade or by that curtain. Yeah. So, you know, when we come out in the world, we say, wait a minute, instead, I'm going to this party and I know that I'm going to have a great time. I'm going to speak with people and they're going to speak with me. And as you think, so you are. So that level of confidence changes in your life and it manifests something different. How important it is that when you understand this, what happens is you begin to clear your consciousness, your thoughts, your awareness, of all this stuff that wants to bog you down and anchor you down and hold you down. It's kind of like being in a helium balloon uh, or a, a, a balloon ride, you know. You get in the basket with a big helium balloon. It has all these sandbags around it, doesn't it? The purpose is to hold you down, right? Hold you down long enough until you can get in the, in the basket to take off for the ride. But what happens for that balloon to take off? They start what? Letting go of the bags, don't they? Cut that bag off, drop that bag off. Whoa, all of a sudden you're taking flight, aren't you? All of a sudden you're rising higher and higher. How important it is then that we do this in life. If you want to rise to a higher consciousness, if you want a higher gaze, we've got to let go of some stuff, don't we? We do. We've got to let go of it because it's been bogging down in our life. And fears that you have uh, held on for so long have been taking control of your life. Now you decide to take control of your life. And you know what? You're digging new roads in this world. Now, digging new roads and making new roads isn't always an overnight project. We see that demonstrated in the state of Georgia, don't we? Yes, Traf 
the, the road construction is going on for years in one intersection in my home area. It's like, okay, this is year number two, and wow, road construction has really taken them a while. How about in our own lives? We're building new roads. We're building new roads as we make changes. I want to encourage you, it doesn't happen overnight. But it's a long journey. But it's one that you're consistent as, as you make that commitment to say, I keep my eyes on the prize. I keep my eyes in a heavenly gaze. I rise in consciousness and awareness to the highest and best. And as I do, I'm doing something wonderful. I'm doing some mental house cleaning, you know, some good old fashioned mental house cleaning where you got to clean out some stuff, you know, some garbage. You got to get loose. You got to get rid of it. You know, got to. Good, good garage sale in mind. You know, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to put it out. I'm going to put it out on the street for somebody else, but it's not going to be for me. But then, with every house cleaning, there has to be a refurbishing. Because you can't just let go of this stuff without putting something new in. So it can't be just that you're saying, oh, I get rid of all these thoughts of fear, but you've got to fill it. Refurbish the mind. Refurbish the house of your mind, of your mental outlet which says, I know I place in this dwelling of my consciousness the affirmative, the positive, the knowing, the beautiful things of God. I refurbish my mental house. I clean out the old, but I got the new. How wonderful it is to go furniture shopping, go out looking for something new to furnish your house, to dress up your house, right? Don't we all enjoy, love that? We like to have some, well, how about enjoying some refurbishing of the mind as you clean it out and you allow it? Because a life allows you to think as you please, but it's always going to produce for you what you think. It's always going to produce for you what you think. You can think whatever you want. So how important it is that we take time to say, I'm going to get rid of the old and welcome the new. Because your future will be your present mind extended. Let me break that down for you. Your future is based on what you're thinking right now, where your gaze is. Where your ideas are. Because if you're thinking, Psh, life's the pits. I have to tell you this. Your future is going to be life's the pits. Because it's based on that kind of consciousness that you're embracing right now. You're looking at the earth or the world or the physical around you. And you're just saying, this is where my mind is. But as you go about day to day and you fill it with this faith-filled, optimistic, positive outlook that says, I know I am the divine. I am success. I am prosperous. I am health and wholeness. I am these things. And when you do that gratitude for all those things you just claimed, it becomes your tomorrow. It becomes your future. You shape it. You shape it right here and now with the thoughts that you bring to mind. That's a faith-filled life. The future is in your mind and heart, and the future is found within, not without. Don't be looking to everybody else to shape your future. Go within. Go to the higher gaze. Go to the understanding that the goodness of God is there for us. For the future, let me tell you, is now. I love this passage that says, Behold now, we are sons of God. Behold now. Now, right now. Right now, this moment. You're the son of God. You're sons of God. You're children of God. How beautiful it is to understand what that means. That right here, not, not someday, not when you die, not someday, you know, down the road, not after you've completed X amount of Bible classes, not when you've gone through this or that or hoops or jumped through these uh, rules and regulations of a church or whatever. You are it now. It's time for you to realize that right here and now. I'm the child of God, and I have the right to look to the divine source, the divine father the divine parent, the divine giver of all good things. And when my gaze is there, possibilities are unlimited for me. So I invite you to look to the mountains. Oh, not the Georgia mountains, not the Rockies, but look to that higher plane. Let your eyes, your gaze, your spiritual thoughts move to a higher level of understanding and look consistently. Gaze, gaze, you know, be in a daze with the gaze, you know. And I mean, just like, oh, wow, I'm gazing and I'm just focused where I'm just really staring and looking at it in such a powerful way that it's steady 
and I gaze in my studies and I gaze in my prayer life and I gaze because that's where I'm looking constantly. And I invite you then to allow the positive unfolding of your good, the optimism, the possibilities that you see begin to shape your reality, your future. It's there for you. So as we look to this beautiful truth found in the ancient texts, it's inviting you to answer the question, what you looking at? That's right. What you looking at? Where's your gaze? Where are your eyes? What have you put your eyes upon? It will shape, it will mold, it will create your future. Amen.